The game has many faces, and everyone has a story. My name is Jeremy Schiedinger, and come along for the journey as the farm system explores where the game was, where it is, and where it's going. From big league clubhouses to little league parks, this game has a lot to offer. For the first time ever, this series will attempt to pull back the curtain and demystify the game. The stories, those are endless as we pull perspectives from inside professional baseball, down through all levels of college, into high school and youth baseball, the highest levels of softball, business professionals, and even training facilities. Come along as we connect the dots and celebrate the special people from within our community telling their stories from inside the game we all love. This is The Game. has a story. My name is Tasir Badar, and this is the story of ZT Athletics. My parents are first generation immigrants from, from Pakistan. And uh, so we grew up, my parents were very conservative in their mindset, in their mentality. So watching the Brady Bunch was risque. So I grew up in upstate, well, Wisconsin, upstate New York, between the age of three and like eight or nine. And the only thing you could watch on TV was either the news at my house or Yankee baseball. So that kind of like every night Yankee baseball, literally every night, 162 games we were watching every night. So I was the youngest of four. And I watched, I think the first game I remember, like, like, like believe it or not, like three I remember, watching Chris Chambliss hit that home run and everybody running on the field against the Royals. I hated George Brett, the Royals, and we all hated him. And then obviously I remember the next year or two years later, uh, I, you, know, I, you know, watching in a, my dad worked in a paper mill and he was a little bit a while away. He had been taken up a project about 50 or 100 miles away and we took a bus. It was in October, it was a blizzard in October, which is very early. And we took a bus on Greyhound and we were stuck in this, in this depot, home, in this, this kind of like a Greyhound depot. And my brother put a quarter in, I remember, and a little TV four inches to watch Bucky Dent hit that home run in 1978 to beat the Red Sox that one playoff game. So I know I've been watching baseball since then. And I love it. it's a thinking man's game. I love it. it's a team. I love that the 25 that had come together to win, it's not about one person. Um, it's like life in the miniature. You know, I play tennis. Uh, at a very, very high level. And that's like a life in the miniature too. But it's about you against the other person, especially playing singles, which I played. This is like the team. So I was really into that. I loved it. Followed Yankee baseball forever uh, through the lean years of the 80s, even moving to Houston, looking at the, at the paper, because at that time there was no uh, you know, ESPN and sports and watch it and track it. So even through lean years of Mattingly, and, all the way up to 95 when Magley hit the Grand Slam and literally the, almost the shake, roof shake shook and to the point where I can afford to actually go to a Yankee game. First time in my life, Pedro versus Clemens in 2000, I want to say three, uh, at 30 years old, you know, to watch it, to see that kind of come together. And now I'm a second row, first base Yankee season ticket holder. I live in Houston and I have a place in New York as well, but it's, uh, Pretty humbling to think about where I started. My family's all about we kind of we can fight, hate each other in our family, all these things. But when it comes to Yankee baseball, we all unite on a text every day. So uh, that's how it kind of started. Uh, and then with my son, uh, he rolled the ball to him literally when he was born. And uh, so I started this passion around getting him involved, getting around the right people, setting the right environment. I made a lot of mistakes, just like dads do all the time. 
but you know, now it's all about him and it's grown into this 160 teams that we've had. It's just about one team for him and then the coaches and it kind of took off the concept. So that's how I got into baseball and that's where it is today. So I've been coaching travel baseball at the highest level for 10 years now. So it's very similar to Major League Baseball where they have single A, double A, triple A. Uh, so Little League Baseball would be more just caliber wise, more like the single A level. And then there's double A, triple A, and then there's the major level um, where it's typically the best athletes for that age group. And uh, at the major level, they typically travel across the country to play each other. The traveling is, is to get more competition. So whenever you're playing just the local teams, there might be three or four teams that can play at the highest level. So to play against the best teams, you might have to travel up north. We're from Southern California, so we'd have to travel to Northern California, maybe to Arizona. Uh, once a year, we go to Texas, sometimes twice a year. And then at least once a year, we'll travel to the East Coast um, because we want to, uh, we have a, a goal of to try to be national champions. And the only way you can do that is to try to play the best from around the country. So we travel for that reason. So the lower level you are, the less you travel. The higher level that you get, the more, more often you travel. My name is Darren Larson. I'm with Perfect Game, Vice President of Youth Development. Currently mostly operate out of Houston, Texas. Been doing this a long time. My kids started once, my oldest is 27, so he started back when they were six, seven years old playing in the league, league ball, right? Then we did a little summer league at six, and at that time, we basically, select ball in the state it is right now, was just starting out. So there was like mostly, it was mostly AAA and major teams. It kind of, at that, at that time, it was more of if somebody told you we were gonna make you a double A team or something like that, you might've got punched in the face. Um, about three, four years later, uh, it went the other way where the double A is really the dominant where most of the players are at. And if you threaten to move them to triple A, they wanna punch you in the face. It's kind of flipped. Um, we try to do, try to keep the games as competitive as, you, as we can. Some people out in the market basically want it to go back to the way it was years and years ago with one division basically a major division but those games it's not fun for anybody like it's not fun for the top level teams it's not fun for the recreational teams that are just trying to have fun and trying to develop their players um, so with the current model you basically are allowed to get teams to where you have scores that are 12 to 13 uh, 10 to 9 and occasionally some 15 to 0 type games and so we try to keep it as competitive as we can uh, playing like minded organizations or teams. It was about my son at first uh, because what I saw uh, when I got into it was I wanted to make sure that he had a good environment. He knew what, you know, and we've gone through a lot of different iterations of that to get to where we are today, which we're really happy with. Uh, and not to say we, that won't change as well as he evolves, but I think that what God wanted me to do is I this is a very true story. His first team, he was six. He was playing on an 8U team. Uh, he's a big kid, so he played two years up. And these kids literally did not know how to catch a fly ball. An infield fly ball, not an outfield fly ball. Uh, a lot of our kids on our team were African-American. Uh, they didn't have money for cleats. They were really running backs and linebackers and wide receivers. They didn't know anything about baseball. We were the bad news bears literally uh, and that was the first team it wasn't ZT baseball we worked played for an organization called hustle and but I funded it personally by the end of the year we won the most prestigious tournament in that region uh, in Sulphur Louisiana for an 8U team it was uh, at that year it was uh, the Sulphur Louisiana select World Series or whatever and we were 29th out of 30th seed that's how bad news bears were. We ran the table. And that was, I have, a, I have many jerseys, if you can imagine. I know a lot of major league players. A lot of them are my dear friends. But my favorite jersey in my memorabilia room is those kids signing that jersey to me. And that of that winning that championship, of a game used jersey. And it was super cool. So that got me the passion to put behind it, uh, to see those kids 
go from not being able to catch a fly ball to running the table with, with these other teams. We were made fun of at the beginning. At the end, we were the champions. So it was, it was super cool. Well, I've been lucky enough to coach different age groups from as young as eight years old all the way up to high school age groups. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've won about seven national titles. Um, we, those national titles are always in the summertime at the end of the year. So we play a season where we play big tournaments throughout the year, but everything is to get ready for the national championships at the end of the season. Um, there's different organizations. There's um, USSA or organization. There's Perfect Game organizations. They always have their big event at the end of the year. So wherever the best teams and the best competition is, that's where we go to go and compete for national titles. Yeah, I mean, we've had some teams in the past that have been like 93 and two. Uh, we've had some teams that have won four, five, six national championships in a row, um, different age groups. Uh, we've been lucky enough to have kids now move on and graduate and go into college, playing at the schools, Vanderbilt, Mississippi State, Miami. Uh, we have guys that just recently starting to get drafted now that we've been kind of coming towards the end of our 10 year run. Uh, so it's pretty cool to see that some players that we had when they were eight, nine, 10 years old kind of develop and, and get to that level. Uh, so we as coaches, we've been able to kind of learn from them what they did to get to that level. And then also some of the kids that might have been better than them when they were younger, seeing what they didn't do, um, what kind of prevented them from getting that to that level. Because we had these guys at the youngest age group, they were considered the best in the country and seeing what route they took and just kind of learning from that and then trying to implement that into what we do now. Uh, but we've had um, teams that, I mean, shoot, like we're always in the top three in the country, um, no matter what age group we do. And I, I really believe it's because of the system we put in place, the goals we put in place, and um, just kind of how we attack that season is a big part of it. Perfect Game has been awesome. I mean, they Perfect Game was more on the high school side. They're an MLB uh, scouting service. Um, they've done a phenomenal job of making it all about the baseball. and. They've got showcases, they've got scouting combines, they do everything really well in the high school market, and that's where they've been for 20 years, basically. So with ZT Baseball, the passion project, it's just too big now, 160 teams. Uh, last time I checked, it could be 175 today or 145, I don't know, it just keeps moving, but it's, it's growing every day. Uh, we feel we're getting to the acquisition stage now. We're taking on folks that a couple of acquisitions we have on the table that we feel will bring in the right management team can figure out how we can implement it with the, we paid for branding basically, you know, and we've paid for the right coaches. And now the ZT name is very well known throughout the country, especially in California and Texas and many other states, but California and Texas, which is two of the biggest baseball states, I would say. But if I can go back to those four areas of business, acquire, professionalized scale, liquidity event, you know, we may, and also I can learn how to run an organization like this with the right, because there are people out there, the opportunity in baseball is how you can professionalize it and scale it in a system, like McDonald's, they're all the same, right? How to make ZT baseball all the same? That's the challenge, but that's the financial opportunity. And it's also for the kids and parents, that's the opportunity for them. You go to Stanford, that coach calls Joey, ZT kid. Oh, they already know what to do. That's what I want. If that happens, I'm super happy. Yeah, so I mean, there's all there's pros and cons to that, right? Like ranking eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, sometimes that seems crazy. Um, but what it does do is it gives kids uh, kind of a bigger goal, bigger purpose. A lot of them, they like that. They want to be considered one of the best players in the country, so they put in real work. Um, what we've seen in the past, some of the kids that have fallen off, uh, a lot of it is just because they don't put in the work or if they are, they're going through the motions. So a lot of these kids that are highly ranked, they want to keep that ranking. So they put in real work. Um, they'll maybe go hire some really high level trainers, um, go to some facilities that have trained big leaguers in the past and they just continue to develop. I mean, what I've seen is these big, strong kids that are at a young age, if they continue to train with the right people, sky's the limit for them. Um, if they train with the wrong people, then things could go, go the other way. Um, because you've seen in the past, those little league kids that are really big, hit bombs, and then they get older and they kind of fall off. Um, the one of the things that we've learned is tools never go away. So like if, you, if you're a big kid with tools and, and you work and train, you're gonna be elite for a long time. The undersized guys that have tools, once they get bigger, stronger, faster, and get trained correctly, they become um, like in the rankings and, and getting recruited, they get highly recruited and they do really well as well. The tools never go away. 
Um, but a lot of it is in the training on how they approach it and how they get after their training is a big piece of it. Yeah, so from like now compared to 10 years ago, eight years ago, there's way more resources. There's more training facilities. There's more high level coaches. Um, parents are willing to put in more money and more time into their children to train them properly. So eight, 10 years ago, it was you played on the team, you practiced a couple of days a week, and that was your only way to get better was those two or three practices. Um, then it started evolving where some of the, the, the players and the parents wanted them to get better. So they started hiring high level pitching coaches, high level hitting coaches, going to um, big time facilities and training. So the, the amount of training players are doing now is like probably 5,000% what it was eight years ago, 10 years ago. And then the resources they have. Um, the downside of that is there's a lot of guys trying to make money and training kids kind of in over their head a little bit. Maybe they don't have the resources there or maybe they, they think they know certain things and they're training kids the wrong way. And that can hurt you as well. Cause it's not just training just to train, it's training with the right people and training the right areas. Um, so we've learned that. So it's been an evolution where there was no training. Then there was a lot of training, but a lot of it being kind of like the wrong type of training. And then all of a sudden now there's a lot more access to elite level guys and elite level facilities. So uh, it's getting better. It's still not perfect, but it's definitely getting better. I look back, I mean, even, even over five years ago, or like when my 27 year old was 10, what, what's getting taught now versus then, like just incredible differences. And even the last three or four years of watching hitters, right? I have a 23 year old still playing college baseball. I look at what he's doing and what he was doing five years ago. And then I, I watch a lot of the high school guys come into a facility I'm at all the time. And I see what they're getting taught. And it is, it's night and day. It's like you're looking at, I mean, you got seven, seven year olds turning double plays like they're in the big leagues. I mean, you, their swings are looking like they're high school guys. And so that's, I mean, I think the select ball, the way it is right now is the reason you have the Mike Trouts, the, the Bryce Harpers and those guys, why they're, they were ready to jump into the big leagues a little earlier is because of the, the playing that they had with select baseball. Like if it wasn't for select baseball, those American players, American born players wouldn't be ready to get into the major leagues as soon as they have been. That's my opinion. Player development, you know, for example, and what you do here wasn't available then. Just wasn't for in any sport, in my opinion. And coaches didn't believe in it. And by the way, a lot of the coaches still don't believe because they're still old school. See the ball, hit the ball. That's all they think about. Uh, but when we were growing up, it was like, hey, stay in shape, you know? Uh, and staying in shape didn't mean, you know, like, for example, uh, staying in shape didn't necessarily mean being, like, lean. It meant, okay, that you could last the whole game. <laughs> you know, it was just like, it was, you really did, bodies broke down uh, a lot earlier than they do today. The idea of yoga, we didn't have the idea of what Kobe Bryant did, the Pilates, the reformer, and all these things that, that, that you have today that really could make you a great ball player. The thing, the challenge that you all, you all face as generation is, will the coaches buy in to these Kobe Bryant type mentality, which revived his career? First of all, I hope that every kid gets the, it gets the chance to be developed. And it's not just about winning today, right? Because our goal is to get them to that division one scholarship first make the high school team right development is such a broad term but if I could they even had a chance to get developed and that to me is huge right because a lot of I think coaches in today's world they don't develop they win and I think if you combine the two where the kid loves playing because they like to win and it's fun you know and they can get developed that to me is something really important and you got to go with that you got to give it a chance. Whatever you're doing in development, I think next 10 years, there'll be so many different ideas like you have and there'll be people like you out there. But if you keep jumping around, you'll be spread too thin and you'll not learn anything. That's what I hope the challenge is that I think people need to buy into one strategy and stick to that. Wait a minute, yo. Here we go, here we go. Put our head up in the air. Here 
There's different organizations have different goals, different priorities, right? There's some organizations that are all about development, which is great. There's some such, um, organizations that are all about getting kids to the right colleges. There's some that are all about making money, unfortunately. Uh, one of the things that was important to me was to be part of an organization that wants to develop, get kids to the right school, but have them ready day one when they get there. And a piece of that is winning. Like winning at the highest level is very important. And the reason why is when players are a part of something bigger than themselves, they put in real work. So what's, what's happened in the past where kids are just putting in work to put in work, they're going through the motions and there's not a big time goal, they fall off or they just kind of just showing up. But whenever you give them a goal at the end of the year to go win a national title or, or go let's go try to be a top three, top four team in the country, they put in different type of mentality when they put in that work and the results have been crazy. So we've had guys day one freshman year going to big time colleges and competing and being a big part of that team right when they get there because they played at a high level, they've been there before. Uh, we talk about iron sharpens iron. So it's really important to me to be part of an organization that wants to play with the best and against the best. Not all organizations are built that way, but that was one of the priorities of ZT Baseball and that's kind of why I went that route. Um, because I was part of an organization was, that was important to them at the youth level, but at the high school level, um, it was something that wasn't a priority anymore. Um, so I needed to be a part of something that was bigger than me, bigger than my players, where we're gonna go try to be the best program in the country. And you're gonna hit your individual goals. We're gonna try, if you wanna go to Vanderbilt or Stanford or be a draft guy, we're gonna give you the resources to do that. But while we're doing that, we're gonna go try to win at the same time. Uh, that's a struggle you know, I go through in my mind because I didn't, it's not that I ever sat the nosebleeds in the Yankee Stadium. I never went to Yankee Stadium. And he gets to go, he gets to, hey Rod, he calls Uncle Alex. You know, it's a different thing. I want him to have the hunger, you know, that, that I had and the drive, which also came with the father saying, I don't have a job tomorrow. Whereas he doesn't have that issue by grace of God. So this is a, it's a struggle we have, uh, but I think he's very humble. His mother's done a great job raising him. Uh, but I want to look back and say, hey, yeah, I have all these resources. How can we take this to the next level? You know, how can we do that? Um, and at the same time, use what he's gotten and appreciate it to really work on himself. That's how I hope he looks back on it. You know, and you know, it's still, it, we're still in that t space of time. We don't know. Can he look back on it and go, I used it to my best? And making the major leagues is impossible. If any one of your parents go, oh, my son's going to make the majors. I'm not saying let's not have dreams. I have a dream to buy the Yankees. You know, and I still have that dream. Um, and will it happen? I, I, I don't know. Uh, but I have lofty dreams. Making, ma making the majors is a lofty dream. Let's start with making the high school team. And then... Can we get a Division I scholarship? And then it's up to God, right? So I just want him to look back on it. If he doesn't make it in the, in the majors or college or whatever, I loved him no matter what. He did his best. That's all I care about because in the world of business, life, friends, relationships with his future partner in life, life partner, I hope he takes what he learned here. Teamwork, staying humble, the grind, what it takes to be in the foxhole with your friends when you're at the game of the line, that sixth, seventh inning, and you gotta deliver. And if the guy strikes out, pat him on the butt, give him a hug, we'll do it tomorrow. All those things I hope he gets from this. I think a lot of it is being true to what your intent is. So when I coach these kids, they're all, in my, in my mind, they're all my nephews. I want what's best for them. So if it's better for them to go to an elite hitting coach than, than have me, then I'm gonna have them do that. Um, the intent is to teach them how to compete at the highest level, win or lose, succeed or fail, compete at the highest level so that way when they get to those big time high schools, those big time colleges or even pro ball, that they're mentally ready and prepared. They've succeeded and failed in big spots. That's our intent, that's our goal. It takes a village to get these kids where they want to get to. They've had multiple hitting coaches, pitching coaches, trainers, teachers, high school coaches. Um, it takes a lot of people to get them to go to the right place and succeed there. Let me
whistle sound. Everybody get down when we give it to you. Everybody feel it come around with the rhythm. It's a sound. Everybody get down, down, give it to you. Everybody feel it come around with the rhythm. Rhythm now. Everybody get down when we give it to you. Everybody feel it come around with the rhythm. It's a sound. Everybody get down when we give it to you. Everyone has a story. I'm Scott Baker, and this is the story of Basic High School. Played the HPRD from, I guess, like eight years old um, until, I think, 12 years old. Um, always loved it. I mean, from even uh, in the summers playing wiffle ball every day. Um, just, just a constant uh, love for the game. Um, went on to, after Little or after HPRD, went on to what was called juniors. Um, at that time, kind of a weird story, but um, when I was younger, I was actually kind of big. Um, and so I was one of the better players. So I loved it. As I got to the junior level, I didn't grow. And everybody grew, and I was kind of on the outside looking in, for the most part. Um, and so there became a little bit of self-doubt um, kind of wondering, you know, hey, what's going on here? And I dabbled in some other sports, and so I, you know, maybe I should go into play football, um, getting ready to go into high school. Um, you know, what, where, what am I gonna do? Um, but as I got into high school, I think I tried out for football, and it took about three or four days for that to figure out that I didn't want to play that. Um, but got into high school and uh, went out for the team um, and played at basic high school. My love was there, but I, as, as my sophomore year came, my junior year came, um, I played JV baseball as a junior. And so that was, you know, a little humbling, um, but I loved the game. And so I wanted to continue to play. Um, senior year, some things started changing. Um, I started growing a little bit. I started maturing a little bit. And all of a sudden, this little scrawny little kid started throwing a little harder, becoming, you know, just a lot better player. And so, didn't have a college scholarship um, until after the high school season was over my senior year. Um, I think I was at about 80, 80 miles per hour my senior year. Um, went to the senior all-star game and Arizona Western, after the game, reached out and said, hey, we want to give you a scholarship. Um, and then things started changing really quick. Um, got into the physical side of it, started weight training a lot. Um, Went off to college, and within about four months, I gained 20 pounds. I grew five inches, and my 81 mile an hour fastball went to 92. Um, and so from there, my career started, you know, and, and then I went on to play a couple years in college. Um, luckily, I ended up getting drafted. So it's kind of a bizarre story. Um, the love of baseball has always been there, but I went from being kind of a really star player to almost borderline saying I can't play to actually going on to play in college and then actually being drafted. There's another coach here in town who played with me here. Um, he coaches at Cimarron High School, Mike Hubel. He was my catcher in high school. Uh, we were pretty close friends, almost best friends. And uh, you got a phone call back then. So nowadays it's, it's TV and everything, all the glamour and everything, and everybody knows what's going on and you kind of know, what's, you know where you're gonna get drafted in the slot. I had just been told that I was gonna be called on the first day. You know, and so I'm over at Mike Hubel's house and we're, kinda, we're playing poker. There's like six of us playing poker and it gets to be eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. And so for me, the, the call wasn't coming. You know, and so I wouldn't say I started panicking, but it was just, hanging out with the guys, move on and it's over. And just randomly at about 10 o'clock at night, my mom called over to Mike's house and said, uh, you've been drafted, you know? And so a lot of celebration um, with my friends. Uh, I left because I wanted to go be with my family. My dad was, you know, very emotional. My mom was emotional. Um, I was emotional. 
I'm emotional right now. Um, pretty, pretty cool um, to be able to say you've been drafted, you know. Looking back now, there's just so many levels of, of the transitions of, of the, the speed of the game. And, and um, I was still young and immature. Um, kind of got thrown in thrown into the fire pretty quick and, and had no choice but to grow up. Um, uh, seven days after I got drafted or 10 days after I got drafted, I was sent to Johnson City, Tennessee on my own. Yes, I had been to college for, you know, a couple years, um, but it's just, it was totally different. Um, you're around other draft picks, first rounders, um, the elite of the elite, um, playing in front of crowds. And so the, the transition was um, a whole nother level. You know, it, it, you, you think you're good until you're there. And then you go, okay, wait, wait a minute. Everybody's good, like really, really good. And so kind of an eye opener, you know, eye opener and, and uh, my work ethic changed overnight. Um, I automatically went, I wouldn't say I was ever lazy, but I went from uh, somewhat of a, a lackadaisical kind of, I'm really good, I'm a star type of attitude to first one there, last one to leave. Um, immediately I became a student of the game, learning, 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 being a sponge, asking questions. Unfortunately, I, my career kind of came to an end. Uh, I played in Korea um, in the KBO in 1998. Um, had a phenomenal year over there, one of the greatest experiences of my life. Um, came home and, and for the first time in my career, I had arm problems. Um, wouldn't so much blame it on Korea, but I did pitch a ton over there. Um, a lot of short rest pitching um, and so I ended up having surgery, I had a torn labrum. Um, played a couple of my last couple years in independent ball, um, just trying to hang on and see if the surgery, you know, uh, could keep me in, you know, I could get back to my uh, top shape. Um, and just kind of, just I just knew it was kind of time to, to shut it down. Um, living out of a suitcase for 12 years, um, kids were getting older. Um, so it kind of just writing was on the wall. You know, and so I had no clue about coaching. I, I, I didn't even think about it. It was always just, you know, do what I gotta do to get back to the major leagues. Um, so when I did do it, my kids were uh, nine and seven, I think at the time. Um, Tyler was playing Little League, daughter was in, you know, gymnastics and cheer. Um, struggling a little bit with, you know, it's over. Um, what do I do next? You know, do I go back to school? Do I, you know, just go find a job somewhere? And it's just crazy how things work. But um, I went to a little league practice for Tyler, and club ball was just starting to really pop. You know, and and uh, just kind of was like all of a sudden one day said, "Let's go make a team." He played with a, a local team here for about, I would say, about a year. Um, and then I just kind of wanted to build my own team. You know, I, I just started getting the itch and seeing seeing the daily baseball of the, the, the club ball circuit of how it was running and uh, wanting to support my son. Um, so I delved into it, thinking I was, thinking I was the guru, uh, and I wasn't. Um, so started my own team. Um, very, very fortunate and lucky to have some players on that team that were uh, Bryce Harper, Joey Gallo, um, Tanner Chauncey, um, I don't want to miss them all, there's, there's a ton of guys, but uh, Morgan Stotts, uh, a, lot, a lot of draft picks, a lot of major leaguers that are they're still there to this day. Um, coached that team for about three to four years. Started learning a little bit about, you know, the, the lower level coaching and, and trying to give back what I, you know, what I learned from the game. Um, and then random, just a random day one, uh, talking to one of my uh, dads that was in club ball um, his he, he had a, a question for me hey you want to coach high school baseball I was like uh, no I mean I don't I don't know what do you mean it's like well Bishop Gorman uh, coach chef Chris chef out of Bishop Gorman's looking for you know an assistant he played professionally I said wait I, I think I know that name 
Uh, so I went over to, to meet with Chef and I, he hired me that night. Um, and so I was kind of doing two duties at the time. I didn't want to give up on the, on the, the youth team until it was time. Um, so I kind of coached the, the youth team, the club team, for about another year and a half while I was doing Bishop Gorman. Um, and then I was an assistant at Bishop Gorman for about seven years under Chris Sheff. Um, and then the, the, the real learning started to take place of, of how to coach. And there for seven years, um, Coach Sheff actually took the college job here in town, CSN. I went with him there. Things didn't work out there too well. Um, at the same time CSN wasn't working out, the basic high school uh, head varsity job opened up. Um, that was 10 years ago, I think now, maybe 11 years ago. Um, now being a head coach, way different than being an assistant coach. The, the duties are different, the, the demand is different, um, pretty much everything. The daily, the daily routine is totally different. So what I thought I knew then about coaching from my playing years from coaching club ball to coaching, being an assistant to now being a head coach, wow, how times have changed, you know? And so um, I was very, I was very egotistical. Um, I was very, uh, I know everything, you know, and, and being the head coach, it took me about two years to figure out that I had a lot, a lot to learn, you know, and so, now, uh, you know, 10 years later, um, my priorities have changed, uh, my thoughts have changed, my vision has changed for the kids, for the program. Um, it went from not understanding the dynamics of, of why I was coaching as far as the, the mentorship of kids, um, helping them with school, helping them with colleges, um, and then helping them to be good, good human beings. Um, when I first started, I was more concerned about me, and I'm the best pitching guy, and uh, I know everything, and win, 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 win. Um, and now it's all about the process and the recipe of, of what it takes to have that end goal. We're going to win if we do all the other stuff. And so, long story, but you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool how I've gotten to where I've gotten. The 2016 team was, uh, man, not on paper, not loaded with talent. Um, people disagree because we won it all, but um, we had some arms, we had some, we had some star players, um, so we we had some pieces for sure that that warranted being, you know, a state title type team. But we were we were basic high school at the time, you know, we were kind of the the, the doormat. We were kind of uh, the up and coming, but they're not gonna do it. Um, again, I took the recipe from Bishop Gorman here. Um, we got our teeth kicked in for the first two years I was here. Took over a program that was, I think, four and 24 the year before when I came in. Um, we went and played teams that we probably had no right playing. Um, and we got 10 run quite a bit. There were some tough, tough days. Um, I took a lot of the strategies, a lot of the recipe that we used at Bishop Borman. Um, being tough, being gritty, hard work. Um, and that team, for me, had what every coach is looking for. Um, the, it, the it factor, I guess, the, the genuine care for each other, for the program. Um, the, the change of the culture of the program for that team was something that I, I want every year. Um, still searching for, you know, we've had some we've had some successful teams and we're we're still in the in the mix every year. Um, but that first year, maybe it's because it was my first year. You know, there was some there was some crazy stuff that happened that year. It was almost like it was meant to be. Um, like you know, take a long. Another whole day to tell you the stories of stuff that went that went on and the superstitious stuff that went on that just can't explain. Um, but that group, you know, that that group is very special to me for sure. I'm huge on academics now. 
Not that I never was, but um, you know, we have study halls that are mandatory. Um, we are constantly making sure that we keep their grades up. Um, it's the, the, the demand now for the players is more that it's about if you get the chance to, to, to play college baseball, it's awesome. Um, if you get the chance to be drafted, phenomenal. Before it was my, my vision was you're going to, you're going to get drafted. You're going to be this, you're going to be that. And now it's, it's about getting relationships and building relationships, um, genuine care for the kid, for their families, um, and having that grow over the years. Uh, and, and it's sad, you know, I, I got to admit, it wasn't about that in the beginning for me. I didn't understand the dynamics of that. Um, I was, I guess I was still young and immature as I, you know, I didn't think I was, but, um, I, I love that part now. I love the, the interaction of, of getting to know kids on a more personal level, um, getting involved in, in every part of their life, you know, as, as a second, you know, second father figure, second, uh, parent role. Um, I'll help them with anything, you know, and, and it's very gratifying for me also. My dad's second to none to anybody on the coaching aspect of it. He has a way of leading and getting to kids like no other. I don't, I, I honestly can't explain it. I love being with him every day because I'm learning while I'm working with him. He just has a way to getting to kids. He can, he can uh, encourage them, uh, get them to compete at a higher level if that's even possible. But he just has a way with his words that maybe it's where he's been, where he's played, who he's talked with. He's just good at what he does. So you guys saw us throwing these things. Ah! And you guys were like, we want some. You guys were blowing us up. Everywhere, where can I get them? Where did you guys get them from? All these other things. Well, guess what? We got some for you now. So what do we even use these things for? Teaching athletes to be explosive, teaching them how to load their body, how to unload their body, how to decelerate, direction. These things also have a very particular material. Not only do they have a dope handle on them that we can actually grab and use it like a bat, the other thing is too, is it's rubber, right? Again, it has this difference so we can throw these things with direction and throw them throughout the cage instead of our throwing our $500 bats that you guys have to buy every three months. So these things are awesome for youth athletes when we're actually teaching them how to get extended, how to get the barrel out front, how not to arm bar, how not to drag, right? And how to sequence their body to get directions. So we can use these while we stride. It's gonna clean up some sequencing, which is gonna help with a lot of bat speed. Great for youth athletes, and we use them in prep work every single day before our hitters get into the cage. We don't have a ton of them, so get them while we have them. Get them before they go. Ten years from now, I think it's there's so much tech, and it's gonna. I don't know for sure, but if the right guys are translating the tech correctly, then it's gonna be sky's the limit. Uh, one of my concerns as a as a coach, because I think of these kids like my nephews. Um, is that we overdo it. And, and one of the things at the elite level, if you're overthinking and trying to, like getting too technical and too mechanical, that can mess you up at the highest level. Um, so one of my concerns as a coach is that it can get too far. Um, but if the right guys are translating it and they're able to kind of put it in the right context where you train during the week, but then during the game you go be an athlete, then sky's the limit. I mean, I, we're seeing kids hit balls harder, farther, throw harder now than they've ever have is some kids are losing some of their athletic ability and they're becoming too mechanical and a um, little bit like thinking too much. And that doesn't translate when you're facing the best. It doesn't translate. Um, so I don't know. I know there's gonna be more tech and uh, there's gonna be more trainers because there's, there's a lot more money um, involved now, a lot more parents spending money. And if they spend in the right places and get the right people, they're gonna have some awesome results, but it can also go the other direction if it's not used properly. I hung out with Carlos Beltran a lot when he was in Houston, and he said something in his country. He wanted to play the best eight teams every weekend. Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday was for church and family. I said, well, no. he said, you need to change this. I said, well, the market won't work that way. It just doesn't work here. Uh, I think that I'd like to see more competitive teams uh, play with each other uh, so arms aren't as much hurt. 
happen, injuries don't happen, and also kids can be kids, you know? There, I mean, sadly enough, I don't think there was much player development back in the day. It was just kind of figure everything out on your own, you know, and the, the, your, your dads, your uncles, whoever could be there, you know, uh, volunteer coaches, you know, and, and the dynamics of, ooh, they have changed completely. It is so spe specific, skill specific to each, from the pitching side, the hitting side, the fielding side, speed and agility, strength and conditioning. I mean, it's an array of things. And um, the, I, I, I believe it's all needed for sure. It's taken the game to a whole nother level. Um, kind of multi-sport athletes are still around for sure. Uh, but it is very difficult when you see someone that is sport specific, that is going year round in that one sport, getting repetitions on the hitting side for 12 months out of the year. The de development now, as you can see, the, the major league level is at a whole nother level now. Um, and I, I attribute it to a lot of the one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, lessons type thing. Just the knowledge that everybody has gained over the years on, on everything, the social media aspect. Um, there is so much more knowledge that everybody can gain on a daily basis now. Um, that the, the, I guess the retention level or the rapidness of people learning now has gone through the roof, I think. Um, I think there's a little bit of negative to this um, in the part that I think a lot of people now are missing out on the grind. The environment we try to create here is more of a, it's like a relaxed but really competitive environment. Um, we let the kids be their own people, they have their own personalities, but at the same time, there's a very high respect level. And with that, they know that, that they're here to grind and we're all about competition. I mean, competition breeds improvement. And that's what this program is built around. The old saying is baseball is baseball. You know, the, the, the game doesn't change, <clears throat> but it, it, it is changing for sure. But the roots of it, I don't think that'll ever change. Um, but the dynamics of what's going on, I mean, who would ever thought that, that uh, you couldn't run over a catcher? Who would ever think that the, the shifts that are going on nowadays? I mean, there's some things that are going on that are pretty cool. Um, I'm an old school guy, you know, and, I, and I've had to adapt to a lot of the new, the new age stuff, which it is what it is. Um, it doesn't bother me, um, but I do like a lot of the old school, old school style. But in 10 years, man, I just, you, 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 you can see, I see players being better. Um, uh, I see the, the players getting more physical, players getting faster. Um, who knows how the dynamics of the, the shifts and how the, the games can change on that, that realm. But I just think that the knowledge and the information that's out there, I can only see the, the product getting better and better from what I see. Everyone has a story. I'm Anthony Gillich. This is the story of Central Arizona College Baseball. Everyone has a story. I'm Eric Sim. This is the story of a Juco bandit.